Hey, Kyle with Driveline Baseball here. It's time to do another question and answer file. I uh, got a lot of great questions on Twitter uh, on the giant uh, Reddit AMA that I did. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. All links to everything here are going to be in the bottom right down there in the description. Uh, so definitely check it out. Uh, I know not everybody has annotations turned on, so I'm going to just omit those. All right. First thing I want to talk about is our book update. Finally. Yeah, the... Um, Long-awaited book. It's a culmination of about seven years of research uh, from the biomechanics lab, uh, experimentation, empirical research, stuff I've done on pro organizations, 10-plus colleges, 20-plus pro guys, hundreds of high school athletes and youth pitchers. I really can't wait. It's going to be a really comprehensive book on um, velocity development, arm care, rehabilitation, injury prevention, uh, pitchability. Um, it's going to be really great. <clears throat> and it's a uh, couple hundred pages it'll have dvds uh right now we're not sure if we're going to offer it as online only or prints or both uh we'll probably do both um so that's kind of up in the air but look for it this off season again i'll have more more information on that as it comes i uh, just really wanted to get that out there all right want to get to the questions first question we had was uh from a client former client of mine a uh, current client i guess he's also an instructor in philadelphia uh caesar angeloni played uh johns hopkins also played some uh pro ball so this one's for you um, so you want to ask a bunch of questions about um, different pitchers and pronator flexor strains. <clears throat> and so this is a particular injury that we have a lot of experience with. In fact, we're training an athlete right now from New York uh, who is throwing in the low to mid-90s um, college athlete, and he uh, has suffered pronator flexor strains as well. So this hits home right where we're at. Uh, oftentimes this injury is diagnosed as a uh, torn ulnar collateral ligament, um, as a uh, tear uh, somewhere in the forearm that's not specific. Uh, actually, what it's very common also often accompanies a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament, but not always. Um, and both can be um, true and false in either direction. You can have one without the other, uh, though usually a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament is accompanied by a forearm strain. That's why you see pitchers, they just grab their forearm as soon as they pitch, let a ball go, and they hurt their arm. I saw Matt Crook of uh, Oregon do that this year uh, real uh, in person at the University of Washington Stadium. It was very frustrating. Um, so, what the strain is, is uh, it happens if you overload the pronator flexor mass, uh, which dynamically stabilizes the elbow. Obviously, the ulnar collateral ligament uh, does that quite a bit, um, and that's the main focus of the ulnar collateral ligament, the main function. But the pronator flexor mass, uh, including the um, uh, you know, pronator teres, the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, um, and uh, flexor digitalum superficialis, the three main pr uh, masses, uh, that stabilize the elbow. Those latter two are the biggest uh, focus. Um, both of those are, just depends on the research paper you read and the research you do. Both of those do um, equally large um, work on stabilizing the elbow dynamically and statically. Um, so those get overloaded uh, by the fact that maybe your mechanics are poor, uh, poor conditioning of the pronator flexor mass, um, just a uh, really hot day, poor nutrition, poor hydration, um, poor potassium intake, salt sodium to potassium, uh, electrolyte balance is poor. Uh, there could be a lot of different factors. Sleep um, is really poor. You know, your nervous system isn't working as intended. Um, could be a lot, you know, could be a lot of different things. Um, the one that everybody tends to focus on are mechanics, which, <clears throat> again, this could be a two-hour-long video if I talk about that. But I'm not necessarily going to talk about that. I think conditioning and strength and conditioning is very uh, underlooked when it comes to printing or flexor mass strains. Um, certainly mechanics need to be fixed where, you know, force is not applied perpendicular to the axis of the arm, which means if I'm going here, I don't want force being applied in this direction, which is the maximum amount of valgus stress you can have. You know, research papers by Aguinaldo et al. Uh, really show that the sidearm position with an early torso rotation uh, is really high valgus stress on the ulnar collateral ligament, <clears throat> and therefore the pronator flexor mass can't necessarily do as much work as it would like or is sometimes overloaded. Um, so that's you know a big mechanical factor that we focus on. Um, again, strength and conditioning component is huge, so doing stuff like uh, heavy ball throws, um, you know, plyometric ball throws, wrist weights, grips, um, you know, you can work it in two different ways. You know, you want the the static, the agnostic way, so you can do like farmer's carries, deadlifts, that kind of stuff. And yeah, that works, but you also want to be able to apply it in a sports specific way. So that's where like heavy ball throws, uh, med ball throws, um, you know, specific throwing drills, wrist weight drills, uh, deceleration drills, those come into play. So there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, and again, those will all be in the book. It's a nice, nice little tease there. Um, so that's kind of my short little discussion on pronator flexor strains. <coughs> um, once it happens, you really need to manage it by doing a lot of self myofascial release. Uh, electric stim is also okay. It works. Um, ice is actually okay in this particular instance, uh, especially if you combine it with compression therapy. 
Um, okay, so next up, uh, Tom House Holds. I get millions of questions uh, about the holds. In fact, I get emails from professional athletes thinking I'm the guy that does the holds and that I'm supposed to put together a program for them, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, so that's not that's not the case, obviously. Uh, I, I'm very against holds. My friend Randy Sullivan down in uh, Florida does them with the Armory. Um, you know, I'm sure he's got a di- you know I'm sure he's uh, evaluated. You know, he's very very in depth. Um, I just don't agree with him. EMG data that we've taken um, of the holds shows that they're pretty ineffective, uh, though more effective than I thought they'd be. Um, you can get that training stimulus from a lot of different things like rebounders, wrist weights, um, specific band work, uh, weight room work, if you're interested in training the posterior shoulder. The real problem with the holds um, are, are two factors. One is it is uh, mechanically inefficient. Um, I'll put a link um, to the studies I've done with high-speed video down here again. Uh, uh, the holds are uh, promote a very big pushing mechanism. So instead of thinking about laying this arm back dynamically in external rotation, it's a very hand-dominated throw. So once you have the weight there and you have a grip, you're actually activating the perineal flexor mass, and you're also limiting that layback. As a test, get your hand here, put a 10-pound wrist weight on your hand or a 10-pound dumbbell, lay it back. Feel that layback that you're achieving there, okay? Then squeeze your arm, and you'll feel your arm enter internal rotation, and then this humerus is actually going to glide backwards like this. And so that's actually, you know, that's that's combined with the two, and the reasons for that are, you know, very multimodal. Uh, but the, the answer is that the fact that the more you close this fist and activate these pronator flexor mass um, too soon, it really inhibits both external rotation dynamically, um, and it also promotes a, what basically pushing of that arm. It engages the distal portion before the proximal portion, and that's a really large violation of you know the basic uh, kinetic link and understanding of how we throw a ball or throw objects or kick a soccer ball or swing a golf club and that kind of thing. So that's the biggest problem I have with them mechanically. Two. Uh, is the fitness stuff, which we talked about, um, is that you can get that training effect. If it's about training the posterior shoulder for deceleration, then you can get that training effect from um, wrist weights, uh, which do not inhibit uh, forearm layback because you are not gripping them. Uh, you can get it from band work, doing specific external rotation stuff, though that is not you know, the ideal way to train that. You can get it from rows. Um, if you're talking about a sport agnostic way, you can get them from reverse, you know, um, you can get them from uh, heavy dumbbell rows, even deadlifts work them isometrically. Um, you can also pull ups, are obviously a, a large, you know, great exercise. Um, and a lot of different ways you can do that. Now, uh, if you want to talk about the third problem I have, I guess there are three, is that the claims of holds are very non specific. Okay, I have no debate that the holds program, including the weighted ball throwing that is combined with it, works. Absolutely. The MPA program, Jamie Evans program, almost certainly increases velocity in pitchers, and the holds probably have some positive effect in deceleration. I'm not disputing that. The issue is that we can do better than that, I think. Um, the scientific claims on the holds are very nonspecific. There is no peer-reviewed research on it uh, that they've said that, you know, just look at the science. Um, I've heard from multiple supporters, uh, and I'd love to look at the science, except that there's nothing published on it, um, not even non-peer-reviewed research. There isn't any you know, I don't, I'm not a sucker for peer-reviewed research. It would be nice if it was, but it doesn't have to be. But there's been no data published on it at all. Um, and so I'd like to, besides results, I'd like to see some more specific stuff like EMG readings, uh, perhaps a measurement of IRER. Um, an athlete that I know who went through the HOLDS program um, had significant decrease of internal rotation as a result of the HOLDS, he believes. Uh, and I tend to agree. And so it's actually a pretty interesting um, lack of uh, data there. Uh, and uh, so if the complaint, or the compl- or not the complaint, but the claim is that holds increase the strength of the posterior shoulder, then that's the major factor, then why not throw weighted baseballs and use a different modality, such as rebounders, again, wrist weights, that kind of thing, to train the posterior shoulder. And indeed, that's what we do instead of using holds. And again, we used to use holds back in the day. I actually thought they were pretty good. Um, I know that Scott Brown at Vanderbilt uses them. I've talked to Scott, Scott and I are, uh, you know, he has some of our products there. Um, and they use them to warm up before they throw. And, and that's fine. Uh, I, you know, we're just a stickler for testing and retesting and looking for new stuff. So <clears throat> that's just my thought on that. Uh, again, so 3D motion capture. Someone asked me about, um, do we do three-dimensional motion capture? Actually, this is a factor near and dear to my heart. Um, some time ago, four or five years ago, I was looking into replicating some research that was in uh, peer-reviewed journals. I had read Glenn Fleissig's dissertation. I've read Dave Fortenbaugh's work at ASMI. I've read tons of stuff on how to actually do it. Uh, the grandfather of the papers is uh, Feltner and DePena's 
work um, on quantifying the mechanics uh, during a baseball pitch. Uh, Feltner uh, was the assistant to Dr. Jesus de Pena, who was a very, very influential person in the field of biomechanics in the 60s and 70s. Focus was mostly on track and field now, however, uh, wrote a paper on actually building a laboratory to quantify um, kinematics and kinetics of throwing motion. Uh, it's a great paper. Um, and in it, you can learn a lot, actually, about baseball, not just the subject matter, but they made some very interesting discoveries. Um, so... I, with all that said, some time ago, high-speed cameras became somewhat affordable. I purchased four or five, despite our business not making a lot of money back then. Actually, the business was running at a loss for many years. Uh, and we were able to build our own three-dimensional uh, DLT-based uh, motion capture facility. Um, it was very tedious. worked really well. Uh, I thought it would be very breakthrough in bringing athletes in and out and in and out and, and analyzing them and giving them a report, though the way that we use it now is not like that at all. Uh, we use it to analyze training techniques and deltas, basically. So here's what someone did six weeks later. Here's what someone did after doing wrist weights and that kind of thing. Uh, and then from there we go there. Now, I don't think you need it all the time. I think it's really good to establish a baseline. And then it also tells you what to look for using just like a planar high-speed video. So we have a five-camera system that we're currently upgrading. Uh, really excited about that, which captures overhead, side, you know, um, side view, back view, front view, diagonal view. So really capture as many as we can. And then from that, we can actually make subjective analysis based on the objective data that we have. So I don't think we need to really do DLT and, and analyze every single thing that goes on. You also have to factor in the, um, in, in the lab. Guy in flats throwing to a target. Guys are throwing significantly slower in our lab, which is Marpolis. And then if you compare something like ASMI or Aguinaldo's lab or Modus's lab, where they have markers on, you're talking about a significant reduction in velocity. Uh, in fact, you know, up to 10 to 15 miles an hour. And then it's not consistent among each athlete, and then there's a large error bias there, so that's something to focus on later. But do we use three-dimensional video capture? Yes, absolutely. All right, this video is getting pretty long, so I'm going to kind of speed it up here. Okay, so muscle stimulation. Someone asked me, what do we use? We use the Mark Pro. Big fan of it. Uh, it's expensive, but it works really well. Um, I got it because a friend of mine, Dave Coggin, down at PFA Fitness, told me I needed to get it, that he used it with his UCLA guys, like Adam Plutko and a few other people, and, uh, you know, 27 of the 30 MLB teams use it, I believe. We entered a partnership with them. I couldn't be happier. We use it pre-post throwing. Uh, the Tiger, Detroit Tigers use it before they throw. Uh, a lot of the organizations use it after they throw. Some organizations are starting to use it during... Uh, pitching, which is what I did with the Evo Shield Canes, I told them that they should start using it um, in between innings to keep a uh, pitcher's arm uh, fresh and clear blood lactate. And it works really well. I really can't say enough about it. Uh, uh, more information on that is down in the thing, uh, down in the description as well. So we use the Mark Pro. Compex is a great, you know, product. Uh, I'm sure there's tons of stuff, uh, but we're happy with the Mark Pro. We have a couple units. We plan on getting a few more. Um, in-season stuff. Okay, this is a really complicated thing, um, and so I could talk again for another 20 minutes. But uh, what is the best way to approach in-season stuff? Uh, we, for the sufficiently advanced guys to learn 90 plus, we tend to not do a lot of weighted ball stuff. Maybe once a week at the most. They may play catch with a seven ounce ball, nine ounce ball, just to get some dynamic external rotation and feel that good whip. But beyond that, they're not throwing that much. Um, they do a lot of uh, ply wall work. They do a lot of arm care stuff, wrist weight stuff. A lot of long toss is the primary um, training stimulus in that regard. And so the long toss anywhere from two to seven times per week, depending on the athlete, do a lot of band work, do a lot of foam rolling. It's mainly arm care. You know, if you play professional baseball or even college baseball, you'll understand what it's like to play 140 games in a very compressed time space. So if you play 30 to 50 games in a year, like summer ball in, in high school in a very limited schedule, you'll, it's not that bad. You can do a lot of stuff. For the pros and stuff, that's not exactly how it works. Um, so it's interesting to serve a total, you know, large continuum um, of uh, clients. Uh, and that kind of leads to the next question. What are the best months to do weighted baseballs? We get really into it probably, I would say, primarily between August and March are the biggest uh, months. So we're starting to pick it up now. Though, again, if you're playing outfield um, in high school or pitching once a week, there is time to get, you know, one training session per week, um, you know, because fall ball is not that important. Uh, if you're throwing 82 or 79 or something like that, then the problem is in pitchability. You don't need innings on the mound. You need to get better. Um, and that's kind of how we look at that. So we primarily do them in the winter, I'd say. Uh, another question from a friend, James. He says, why is winter ball so stupid? And I think that's a great question because professional athletes more and more, especially pitchers, are moving to play winter ball. And I understand because if you can go to a Latin country and get paid $10,000 a month compared to your minor league salary of 1600 or $2,000 a month, um, 
it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, the issue is that if you're going to throw 120 to 140 innings at Pro Bowl, then go down to the Latin area and then play and pitch year-round, it's very tough. You know, I'm not a fan of pitching year-round. I believe that people should take three to three to five months off of pitching per year. Um, but again, sometimes it's an economic decision and not necessarily a personal decision, a physical decision. And so that's kind of life. You know, sometimes life gets in the way of being the best exerciser, and that's just life in general. Um, and the last one I want to talk about um, is a thought about the pronated cutter. So a friend, uh, or a new client came in. He's a brother of a big leaguer, actually, um, and he's a senior in college. Uh, and he was talking about throwing his cut cutter, which he holds pretty much like it's pretty standard. So it's going to be a four seam grip, hold it here, offset with the finger pressure being here. And so he always said that you know he's had actually forearm strains. He has very limited cartilage in his throwing arm, uh, and he's had his ulnar nerve moved. Um, because he irritated it while pitching in a World Baseball Classic uh, qualifier for a European country. So, actually kind of an interesting subject. You know, a lot of people, he says he can't get any movement if he thinks about throwing on top of the ball, which is very standard because it just spins off or it becomes a two-seam or it's very flat, especially if you're going to throw it with this type of action and throw it at the hitter and with the idea of creating some deception and pulling down, it's very tough to get some movement. So, most people who throw the cutter actually supinate and pull off this way think about moving it this way like this which turns it into a short slider which again of course is this supinated mov movement this way which can cause you know irritation to the back of the elbow um, and no surprise uh, the person who has this uh, issue has ulnar nerve irritation issues which is common uh, with this type of release flaw, but also um, severe cartilage irritation to the point where he thought he had bone chips but didn't, which again is common. You'll have the ulna colliding with the hyaline cartilage causing irritation and then eventually calcification uh, and then they'll break off to be bone chips. So that's generally what that is. Sometimes there's olecranon fractures that cause that as well, microfractures. Um, but now you know what bone chips, where they come from. Or, uh, depending on just congenital effects, when that ulna collides consistently, you can get irritation of the hyaline cartilage and eventually, uh, you know, de dis denigration, disintegration of that cartilage, which is basically what he has. Um, you know, so he's a good target for something like synvisc of the elbow, though I'm not actually sure that that's what they do when you have cartilage irritation in the elbow. I know it's very popular for the knee. Um, I would assume that that might be a treatment for the elbow, though I don't know anybody who has had that. At any rate, the idea, the way to avoid that, and actually this is one of the easiest pitches to pronate, is to think about pronating the curve, uh, the cutter, not the curveball, and instead of coming off it like this, like supinating here, instead of the finger pressure being down this way with the, with the thumb up like this, we should think about possibly getting here, and you can come off this pitch like this. So if you think about pronating, pulling this side down by pronating, you can actually get the same amount of spin or even higher spin rate uh, and maintain flexion gapping of the elbow like Kelly Sturrott always says in uh, Becoming a Supple Leopard. Very important. Avoids hyperextension at the elbow uh, and really avoids that hyaline cartilage irritation. So, that's a pretty long video. Almost 20 minutes. Uh, but that covers basically all the Q&A stuff. Again, I would check out the Reddit AMA. It's great. 330 comments. Uh, we also have in information on that muscle stim below. Um, discussion of weighted balls, of course, the driveline weighted balls, I have one. This is a prototype one, you cannot buy it because this is a 9 ounce ball that is red. This is actually the first weighted ball that came over in prototypes and it's uh, awesome. The 9 ounce ball in the set is green, um, but this one is red and it's a near and dear to my heart. Um, and so the weighted baseballs have been awesome, they've been selling great. Actually we probably need to resupply pretty soon. So I checked that out, especially with the off season being here. Um, you know, we're getting tons and tons of orders, so definitely check that out. Um, and the book, again, I can't wait for it to come out. You guys are going to love it. Uh, the, you know, title and contents, uh, t table of contents is done. It's, it's the outline is done. The half the book is in the can. You know, the videos are going to be great. Um, really, really excited to release that. I think you guys are going to really love it. Okay, thanks a lot, YouTube. And always look out, for, look out for us at Driveline Bases. So that's at Driveline Bases, not Driveline Baseball. Uh, Twitter. Uh, obviously check out our YouTube channel, make sure you check out all our sweet videos, um, and we will see you soon. If you're thinking about training here in the off season, we'll have about 20 pro guys training here in the winter, and we'd love to have you here, about 100 high school kids, uh, college kids all over the place. And of course, I will always be at Oregon State training uh, those guys down there, so if you are in Corvallis, you can always hit me up. Thanks a lot, and uh, keep those questions coming.